One of the most common stories told about modern science is that it rejects and indeed was born from a rejection of the Aristotelian theory of nature, and especially a rejection of two of its four causes, the formal and the final, final causes. It is true as a matter of history that many early modern scientists criticized some things they associated with Aristotle. But as a matter of philosophy, there just are not, in the arguments of the early modern scientists, refutations of Aristotle's understanding of causality. Instead, what one finds is confusion. My aim in this lecture is to offer an unconfused presentation of what Aristotle meant by the four causes, to make clear that not only has modern science not abandoned them, but that we could not even imagine any genuine, genuinely scientific practice or progress which had. Aristotle was a scientist. He was a pioneering naturalist, a keen empirical observer, and an author of many scientific works. He wrote treatises on meteorology, on astronomy and physical elements, and at least 15 works on general and special topics in biology, including aging, breathing, sleeping, dreaming, he has a treatise on dreaming, memory, sensation, parts of animals, the generation of animals, and more. More often discussed, however, is Aristotle's treatise on the science of nature in general, which we call the physics. Aristotle's Greek term, phusis, just means nature, or the world available to the senses. And so to avoid confusion with modern specialized physics, classical Aristotelian physics is sometimes called natural philosophy or a philosophy of nature. When we want to study a part of nature, a kind of creature or its habitat or a kind of creaturely function like sensing or dreaming or breathing, we define it in a particular way and study its principles. But when nature is studied as a whole, and we seek to understand the principles underlying all of the natural and physical world, we are engaged in physics in the classical sense. Aristotle didn't invent inquiry into the principles of nature, and long before him, those seeking to identify the common characteristics shared by the diverse parts of the natural world focused on one in particular, its propensity to change Natural things move, they rearrange into new configurations, they grow and decay, they change size and shape and location. Even the most permanent and unchanging things in the natural world, astronomical bodies, for instance, change their location. They spin and move relative to other bodies. And as we now know, although Aristotle would not, at one point long ago, they came into being and at some point they will pass out of being, and in between they undergo dramatically dynamic activity. So if we seek the general principles of nature, we need to grasp the general principles of this undeniable fact of nature, namely its propensity to change. But change really is elusive, a peculiar thing to contemplate. As a matter of experience, we can take it so much for granted that we are surprised to notice what interesting intellectual problems it raises. Is change so fundamental that we should assume that the most basic element of the natural world is itself a dynamic changing thing? That in part seems to be behind Thales' hypothesis that all is water and Heraclitus's insistence that all is fire. Even so, change implies such odd puzzles about continuity of motion about how being can emerge from non-being, that some Greek thinkers, finding these problems so difficult, argued that change was impossible. Maybe we experience it, but we know it's not real. Thus, Parmenides argued that all is one eternal permanent being. And Zeno's famous paradoxes are all designed to show that even thinking about change leads to contradictions and absurdities. While we observe change all the time with our bodily senses, it is so difficult to make change intelligible to our minds that even mathematics finds it challenging 
in a way, certain mathematical problems of change were not really solved until the 17th century with the invention of calculus. And even then, the solution to the problem of change rests on positing something very, very strange, the infinitesimal, an infinitely small but non-zero quantity such that an infinite sum of in infinitesimals doesn't add up to something infinite. That doesn't make sense, but it works in math. Plato's solution to the problem of change was more moderate than those who denied its existence, but he still held that things that change are somehow not genuinely real. The physical world is the world of coming to be and passing away, not of simply being. As such, it is only a shadow of some higher reality. Things that change are but participations in separate non-physical realities, the forms, which are permanent, eternal, and unchanging. What makes change so hard to understand? While the existence of change seems obvious to our senses, the idea of change is confusing to our intellect. Our mind wants to grasp things in some definite way. Its concepts are abstract and timeless. But things that change, particular individual things, the very fact of their changing means that they do not stay fixed to be conceived under a stable, unchanging concept. As Plato put it, something that is changing is between being and not being. It is almost something, but not yet that something. When something is coming to be in some way, it is harder to conceive of than just when it is that way. Indeed, to conceive of a thing is to conceive of it as being in some way, but insofar as it just is in some way, then it is not coming to be or ceasing to be, and so it's not changing. Aristotle's approach to physics, then, is to uncover and clarify the concept that we need to make sense of change. Let us reflect on a simple case of change. A grape ripening on the vine comes to be sweet. Let us begin to analyze this by noting that before the change, we have a grape that is not sweet. And after the change, we have a grape that is sweet. We can think of the change as producing a new thing, a sweet grape where there was no sweet grape before. But we can also think of it as some new characterization of something else that remains, a grape which is there at the beginning, but did not have the character of sweetness, comes to take on the character of sweetness. In other words, we have something that undergoes a change, in this case, the grape, and some respect in which it changes from being not sweet to being sweet. From examples like this, Aristotle generalizes and says that conceptualizing change always involves three intelligible aspects, a subject, which undergoes or underlies the change, a privation, the lack of some character in the subject at the beginning of the change, and a form, the character that the subject takes on in the change. This then is Aristotle's general analysis of change. Note that as an account of the elements involved in conceiving of change, Aristotle has thus far not really offered a theory that could be falsified by some new empirical discovery. This is a description of the conceptual framework that must be in place for us to make sense of any empirical observation of change. Empirical observation is always, in some way, observation of change. And if we are able to conceive of change, it is because we can conceive of some subject which comes to have a form where there was previously a lack or privation of that form. Aristotle has drawn on empirical observation to develop his theory, but the theory itself is not a falsifiable hypothesis about one or another particular physical phenomenon. It is a generalized philosophical account, maybe we might even say today a phenomenological account, of the very possibility of physical change and its empirical observation. Now more needs to be said here about form. The word form in Greek morphe, literally means shape. It is easy to make the conceptual distinction between, say, a chunk of bronze or clay and the particular shape or form in which it is configured. It is also easy to conceive of a change, like a bust being carved out of stone, as a new shape being communicated to some underlying material. 
Aristotle invites us to stretch the meaning of the term form so that we can apply it to any determinations or characterizations, including those that are not literally geometric shapes, the taste of sweetness as a form of or in the ripe grape, the color yellow as a form of or in the dying leaf. This use of form, while it has its origins in the technical terminology of Aristotle's philosophy, is really not so peculiar in English. Through education, we form our intellects. Right? We don't think that involves actual physical restructuring of a shape. A discipline of prayer can be part of spiritual formation. Even the word transformation is just a fancy word for change. The subject of the change, which at one point has a privation that is lacks the form, and then comes to have the form, can be called the matter. Indeed, the notion of matter includes both the notion of subject and privation. Matter is a subject conceived of insofar as it does not include some form. Like the term form, the term matter, in Greek, the word is hule, has humble beginnings. Literally, it means stuff or raw material. The word would have been used to describe a pile of bricks and lumber at a job site. But Aristotle stretches this word too, so that anything that undergoes a change and that is conceived of insofar as it is receiving a form in the process of that change is a kind of matter. The grape is the matter which receives the form of sweetness. The leaf is the matter which receives the form of yellow. Matter and form are relative terms. They are understood only in relation to each other. What something is, is subject to different levels of analysis. And depending on the level of analysis, the relevant matter will always be relative to what is conceived of as its form. Let's take an easy example, ice. Ice can be understood as resulting from a form, the frozen solid phase state, inhering in a kind of matter, water. But what if we have an ice sculpture, let's say of a swan, then the ice, which we have just analyzed in terms of both form, freezing solid solidity and matter, water, is itself the matter of the sculpture, the subject of the swan shape carved into it. Even further, if the lights are on and the sculpture is illuminated, the swan sculpture itself can be considered as the matter and the illumination considered as the form of which the sculpture is the subject. This is why I say matter and form are relative. What is considered as matter and form is dependent on what one is conceiving it as. Things get even more interesting if we analyze the ice further into its more basic physical constituents. Ice, we said, arises from water, considered as matter, having a certain form, being in the solid phase state. But water, after all, arises from some form, molecular bonds of a specific type, taking place in a kind of matter, actually two kinds of matter, hydrogen and oxygen atoms. And on another level of analysis, the hydrogen and oxygen atoms themselves can be thought of in terms of forms or atomic structures, giving a spe specific mode of being to the raw material of protons, neutrons, and electrons. And modern sub subatomic physicists can go even further, explaining that protons, neutrons, and electrons are themselves formal states or configurations or behaviors of some underlying material, quarks or bosons or superstrings, or I don't know what the most recent views are, but something like that, right? We can understand the project of modern physics less as an attempt to understand the principles of nature in general, which was what Aristotle was interested in, and more as an attempt to find the most basic building blocks, the smallest or most primal material stuff that underlies the things in nature. In this sense, it might be consciously attending to material causes, but to do so, it must be seeking to strip away from matter the forms inhering in it, sometimes conceptually, sometimes in actual fact and by considerable controlled violence, like in the Large Hadron Collider, right? That takes small particles, slams them together to see if you can get them to not be what they are anymore and see what's left over when you strip away whatever actuality they had before you rammed them into each other. What will physicists arrive at eventually? 
Aristotle without having to engage in sophisticated empirical search in, an, in a sophisticated empirical search for this primal stuff had a name for what must ultimately underlie all physical things. He called it prime matter, something that lacks all form, but is capable of receiving form. So it is what underlies any and all change. Of course, if we describe it as such, we must admit that we could never detect it as such. That is, whatever we detect, we would detect as having some quality or property, which would be due to a form, not to the primal matter underlying it. In other words, prime matter as such is logically necessary. We know it must exist, even though in principle it cannot be empirically detected as such. That is, it cannot be observed existing on its own without any form. You could say we can find prime matter, but never as prime matter. We only find prime matter configured by some form. For, det for to detect something empirically is to grasp it as being in some way, and if it is in some way, that is because it is characterized or determined by some form to be in that way. Another way to get at the Aristotelian notion of prime matter is to recall that the analysis of change in terms of form and matter is meant to apply not only to what Aristotle calls accidental change, but to what he calls substantial change. In accidental change, something remains essentially what it is, but takes on a new characteristic or feature, like my grape ripening. In substantial change, the change cannot be described simply as a thing realizing a new feature, but as a new thing itself coming to be or ceasing to exist. In other words, in accidental change, the matter is a substance which takes on a new accidental form, like water becoming frozen or the frozen water being carved into a swan shape. But in substantial change, some underlying matter takes on a substantial form, presumably like hydrogen and oxygen being joined into water molecules so that what was not water is transformed into water. Since the substantial form is what makes that underlying matter to be a substance, then when we conceive of that underlying matter without the substantial form, that is when we conceive of it as the matter of the change, what is it? It isn't a substance, since that would imply that what persists from the beginning to the end of a process of generation of a substance is itself a substance. Indeed, it would imply that any given generated substance is really at least two substances, right? We would have water and hydrogen and oxygen, or we would have, uh, you know, a, a chicken and an egg that the, the chick, I mean, it's not an egg anymore, right? But that, that just shows that the, the substance that was there before isn't the matter of the substance that we have now. Technically, water is not a mixture of hydrogen and oxygen, which are gases. It is a new compound in which what were atoms of hydrogen and oxygen are in fact now parts of a water molecule. But that means that they're not uh, atoms of hydrogen and, and oxygen anymore. So what underlies a substantial change is not a substance, but there must be something that underlies the change if we were to conceive of it as a change of all, at all. But obviously, we can and do conceive of a substance coming into existence, generation, or passing out of existence, corruption. In the case of living things, we call it death. And we are aware of these as kinds of change. Since every change must involve a subject taking on some form that it previously lacked, there must be a subject of substantial change. This subject is prime matter not existing on its own, but originally under one substantial form, say, as an acorn, and then subsequently under another substantial form, as an oak tree. Notice, we don't think that an oak tree is a kind of acorn. It comes from an acorn. It's not made up of an acorn. But then the acorn is not the subject of the change. It's not what persists from the beginning of the change to the end. The acorn doesn't exist anymore. The subject of the change is the matter of the acorn, which becomes the matter of the oak tree. I have emphasized following Aristotle that form and matter are initially introduced to explain change. But as is becoming clear, we see them as, as, as we see them as principles of change, we can use them then even in our analysis of what is not presently undergoing change. 
For if every physical thing came to be and can pass away, if everything in nature is subject to change, then every physical thing, while it exists, can be conceived of as a compound of matter and form. This is the Aristotelian doctrine of hylomorphism. And now you know enough Greek to know why that's what it's called, right? Matter and form, matter formism. Given that everything in nature is the result of some change, every natural thing is a composite of a formal and material principle. For shorthand, Aristotle will even refer to physical things as composites, that is, things that must be understood in terms of components. But matter and form are components in a very special sense. They are not like the bricks or wood and plaster that are components of a house. Those are all material components. If we conceive of form as one of the components, we cannot conceive of it as some physical object that is stuck to or stacked together with other physical objects. Rather, the form is the organizing principle, the unifying order that makes a substance to be more than just the sum of its material parts. In the case of a house, we might say the form is the design captured in architectural plans. The, the architectural order that unifies the bricks and stone and makes them constitute a house. The form, then, is the principle of intelligibility, communicating that rational order that can be abstracted and understood. Whenever something makes sense to you, you're grasping a form. You're grasping a way that intelligibility has been given to something that previously was, was indeterminate in that respect. The matter, as such, is not yet determinate or defined, and so, in a sense, as matter, is not fully intelligible or understood, like a jumble of bricks and wood that hasn't yet been built into something coherent. Matter is what receives and individuates the form. So form and matter are components of a composite substance, but in this very special sense. The form is the principle of intelligibility, making something to have the specific nature that it does, and matter is the principle of individuation, making that something to be a concrete particular distinct from other particulars, of the same species. Right? So if you, had a, if you had a particular design for a house, that design could be realized in many different houses, right? What is, what is differentiating the many different houses is the particular matter that makes them up. It's this set of bricks here and that set of bricks there. But what is individuated is the, the, uh, the form that can be discerned as common and shared and so abstracted from uh, the many individuals. At this point, it's worth noting how Aristotle's hylomorphism differs from a platonic analysis of reality. Plato's theory of the forms, at least the basic common, the, the basic theory that most people know from the Phaedo and the Republic, which Plato seems to have revised and developed himself in later works, implied a strict distinction between levels of reality. Individual physical things in the realm of change are in a sense less real. What is graspable by intellect is more stable and transcends the realm of physical change, and so they are more real. It is as if Plato would draw a picture of reality with the top half being the realm of the most real, the forms themselves, considered apart from matter, and the bottom would be the least real, not forms themselves, but matter as it participates in or shares in the forms. It is often alleged that Aristotle reversed this priority, for he seems to think that the particular individuals are the primary substances, the most real things, and the forms themselves don't really exist as such apart from matter, but are only available to our minds as logical categories or conceptual classifications we make when we analyze those primary substances. Certainly one of the advantages of Aristotle's analysis over Plato's is that Aristotle seems to better distinguish the conceptual order from the real order. Our concepts may divide the world in one way, but the reality that our concepts describe may exist in itself in quite another way. And one easy criticism of Plato's basic theory of the forms, a criticism that Plato himself anticipated and addressed, is that it makes a separate reality, a form, for each of our concepts, and a higher or more basic form for our most general or universal concepts. So sometimes it is said, that Aristotelian forms are an improvement on Platonic forms, right? And Aristotle's forms are usually lowercase and Plato's uppercase in English. That wasn't, that wasn't a Greek convention, but it's become a convention in modern language. Because instead of being in some alternative dimension that transcends the physical world, 
Aristotle's forms are present in individual things. Plato had material things participating in forms, a vague relationship never really much expanded upon, while Aristotle has material things constituted by forms and matter. But if Aristotle's position seems to avoid some of the difficulties of Platonic dualism, it raises some further questions, many of which Aristotle will take up in his book After the Physics, aka the Metaphysics. In what sense are the forms themselves real? If intelligibility implies universality, then is what's really real ultimately unintelligible? If, if physical particular things are what's really real, does that mean we can't really know them? If form is introduced as something that always informs matter, is it even possible to have form existing apart from matter? I will return to some of these questions, which arise for Aristotle as he reflects on the implications of physics at the end of my lecture. First, however, we have to attend to the other half of Aristotle's four principles or causes in the physics. Aristotle is famous for his doctrine of four causes, and so far we have introduced two, form, or the formal cause, and matter, or the material cause. In what sense are these causes? Aristotle's word cause, in Greek, aitia, had an everyday sense of something responsible or blameworthy. A cause is that which can be held accountable for something. A cause explains. It provides an answer to the question, why? In what sense is the form of something a cause? In the sense that the form of something is responsible in some way for why the thing is what it is. In what sense is the matter of something a cause? In the sense that the matter of something is also responsible in a different way for why the thing is what it is. What makes that, if I could gesture to some such thing, a bust of Abraham Lincoln? Its shape, formal cause. What makes the bronze bust of Lincoln different from the marble bust of Lincoln? Not the form. They have the same identical face. Indeed, the bronze bust may have been cast from the marble one. But the stuff it's made of is what's different. So that's, that is explained by material cause. Even before reading Aristotle, we look for explanations or accounts of things in terms of either formal cause or material cause or both, right? We can ask, why is that rope so strong? And we can say, well, because it's made from a new kind of fiber, right? So that's emphasizing the material cause. Uh, but we could also say, well, because of the way that fiber is woven in a certain way. So that's more a matter of the formal cause. Why did the knot hold, right? Well, because it was a slip knot. Or why didn't the knot hold? Because it was a slip knot, right? So that's identifying formal cause. But we could also say, well, because it was, it was made of such a weak material, right? To identify material cause. Often we look for both explanations at once, right? Why did that structure burn? Well, because it was made of flammable components, material cause, and it got too hot, right? Fire is often the formal cause. Fire in one thing is often the formal cause of fire in another. Why is that bridge able to be so long without collapsing? We have an engineer in the room, right? Because it's a su suspension bridge, right? That's formal cause, the design, with very high tensile steel cables, right? Material cause. As we have seen, formal and material causes can be thought of as constituting or composing a thing. We may call them intrinsic principles or causes. Aristotle's other two causes are extrinsic principles or causes. They do not constitute what they cause, though they are still responsible for it. Sometimes when we ask the why of something, we are seeking a factor which produced the effect. Why did it get too hot? Because it was exposed to fire. Why are the cookies gone? Because I ate them. We, have, we, can, call, we can call this the agent from the Latin for the acting thing. Aristotle most often called it that from which or the origin of motion. Most commonly today, we call it the efficient cause, where efficient doesn't mean low cost or economical, it means effective. It's related to the word for making. The efficient cause is that which acts on something to produce an effect. The fourth cause answers the question of why in the sense of for what purpose or with what intention. Aristotle called it the that for the sake of which. This too is extrinsic in the sense that we don't think of a goal or purpose as a component of something. Indeed, the purpose or goal of a thing is often first understood as the purpose or goal of the agent which produced the thing. 
If a builder makes a house for the purpose of a shelter, we can say that it is the purpose of the house and not just the purpose of the builder that it serve as a shelter. The house itself has a purpose or goal. And with a well-made thing, one can discern its purpose from its very design, its form, without having to ask the person who made it. Right? You don't need to know the intention of the agent if you can read the form and see what the thing is just meant to be. The Greek word for goal or purpose is telos. The Aristotelian tradition typically translates this as end, not in the sense of a terminating point, but in the sense of that towards which something is oriented or that for the sake of which something is done. It is the sense of end that complements the notion of means. A means to an end is a way of achieving a purpose. So this fourth cause can be called the end of something. In the same spirit, it is also called the final cause. Again, where final doesn't mean last in a series, but that towards which something tends or is directed. Notice that it does make sense to think of each of these as causes. Why is there a house on that spot? Because someone built it there, efficient cause. Because a raw material is arranged into a solid house-shaped structure, material and formal cause. Because someone wanted to live there, final cause. Indeed, a complete explanation of something would include reference to all four causes. But sometimes we are only asking for one cause, or fewer than four anyway. And sometimes we conflate causes confusing a question about one kind of cause with a question about another kind of cause. We can do this by mistake. Why is your drawing red, for instance? Oh, because I used red ink, right? Answering in terms of material cause. No, I mean, why did you want it to be red? Clarifying that your question was about final cause. Sometimes we can even conflate them intentionally. So we might do this as a joke, right? You know when geese fly in a V formation, usually one of the legs of the V is longer than the other. Do you know why one is longer than the other? Because there's more geese in it, right? Now, um, not to kill a joke, but uh, we can dissect that, right? Why is that funny? Because you, you think the why question is asking for a final cause, right? But the answer is given in terms of material cause. In other words, it doesn't really answer the question. So here's another one, right? Um, you can just do this to be flip or to annoy someone, right? Why are you wearing your blue sweater? Because I put my blue sweater on, right? Um, this is the kind of thing that kids do to their parents and parents do to their kids once they learn this, like playing around, shifting the, the uh, kind of answer one gives to the why question. Um, sometimes it's funny, sometimes it's very annoying. It's easy to see how final and efficient causes are parts of the explanation of man-made things. A human being with a conscious intention sculpts the sculpture, builds the building, etc. In other words, it is easy to see how an artificial thing is produced when an efficient cause communicates a formal cause to some material cause for the sake of some final cause. But what about natural things and natural processes? Surely they need efficient causes too. The tree cracked because it was struck by lightning. The flower bloomed because it was nourished by sun and water. These are clearly efficient causes, but does an efficient cause and agent in nature act for a purpose? Are there final causes in nature? There are to the extent that we treat things as having natures that incline them or make them tend toward certain behavior. Obviously, the end or purpose is not something conscious, but we find that we make sense of the activity of natural agents by describing the object or goal or purpose of their actions. You've all heard it said that modern science has put final causes aside and rejects the notion that natural things are teleological. But what could this mean? In fact, psychologically, it's very hard to avoid causality, a final causality, even in the most materialistic or mechanistic scientific explanations of things. Animals want food. Gases tend to fill their containing space. Genes seek to replicate themselves. This intending or inclining is not deliberate seeking of a conscious purpose, gases and genes don't think, but it is still an orientation towards something. That towards which something is oriented, what it by nature is inclined to do, can be thought of as a purpose or end of the thing, explaining why the thing behaves as it does. 
To say that it is the nature of table salt to dissolve in water is to say something about how table salt is naturally inclined to behave in certain circumstances. It is to describe table salt teleologically as having a purpose. It is Indeed, it is often the tendencies of things, their propendency, propensity to act in a certain way, that gives us a clue to their nature or what they are. And even if we come to understand the behavior of table salt in greater detail, say, by attending to its material elements and formal structure to better understand why it is oriented that way, in this case, why the molecular bonds of sodium chloride react in a certain way when suspended in H2O, we have not replaced a teleological account. We have only augmented it with a more detailed account of the re relevant material and efficient causes based on what we know are their tendencies or purposes, namely the, the tendencies and purposes of sodium and chloride and electrons and protons, etc. A related important pair of concepts that plays a role in Aristotle's philosophy of nature is act or actuality and potency or potentiality. We've already been talking about these notions implicitly. Aristotle introduces them in the con context of defining motion or change. In the terms we have used already, change is form coming to a subject which pre previously had a privation of that form. But now we may describe change or motion like this. It is the actualization of a potency. Something has a potency when it could be something, but isn't. Something has an actuality when it really is something already. So for instance, before the grape is ripened, it does not have the actuality of ripeness, but it has a potentiality for ripeness. Indeed, to say that it, is ha that it has a potentiality for ripeness is just to say that it is not actually ripe, but could become ripe. Motion, in the broadest sense, not just change in location, but any physical change that a thing may undergo, implies that there are potencies in some or other matter that come to be actualized by some or other form. That which does the actualizing, the agent or efficient cause, must have itself in some way the relevant actuality which it may communicate to the subject. The subject, insofar as it lacks that actuality, is in potency to the actuality, that is to say, it is the material cause which will underlie and receive the actuality communicated from the agent. The Greek word for potency is dunamis. From it, we get our word dynamic, and it can be also translated as ability or capacity. The Greek word for actuality is energeia. Aristotle will introduce another term for it in the metaphysics, but we get our word energy from this Greek word. It is interesting that both dunamis and energeia could be loosely translated in English as power. But there are two kinds of power. Active power, which is the power to make something happen, the power to change things, and passive power, which is the power or potential to undergo something, to be changed. In English, when we describe something with a lot of active power, actuality, we might say that it is very potent. But when we describe something with much passive power, we might describe it as having a lot of potential. So while the language may seem uncommon, the very ideas are ones that modern science has not been able to escape because modern science has not been able to escape the phenomenon of change and so of potencies being actualized. Matter is the principle of potency. Form is the principle of actuality. Efficient causes communicate actuality to what is in potency to receive it. And final causes are the tendencies or orientations things are endowed with by and giving evidence of the actualities they exhibit as the things that they are. I have already suggested that despite the common story that modern science has moved beyond and even emerged because it cast aside formal and final causes, that isn't quite the case. Explicitly Aristotelian language about formal and final causality may be rare in modern science, but the idea of organizing structure and of ordered tendencies has hardly disappeared. If anything, in various ways, science is struggling to recapture a vocabulary for what it left behind in name only, the idea that a whole can be greater than the sum of its parts and that things of different natures have different functions or purposes. 
This is evident most obviously in biology, where living organisms resist any reductionist analysis to mere mechanistic physics. But it's also evident in modern physics, at least as I understand it, where it seems that many physicists are, are uh, trying to articulate how the most basic elemental stuff of the universe, in addition to that, we also need to understand the organizing forces, the principles of structure that make collections of such elemental stuff more than the sum of their parts. It seems like physicists are actually grasping for a kind of language that describes causality. Sometimes they say from above or emergent properties or something that can't be reduced to its elemental parts. It's hard to imagine any branch of science whose assumptions and findings could not be translated into the, to the language of Aristotle's four causes. Still, scientists typically aren't habituated to speak in these terms. How might more attention to the different kinds of causes and their relation be beneficial for the future of science? I will briefly suggest four ways. First, it can help advance scientific inquiry itself. By clarifying exactly what they are inquiring into, attention to the four causes can help scientists be more successful in their inquiries. The language of the four causes helps to distinguish and disambiguate questions at stake in everyday empirical science. Second, attending to Aristotle's four causes can help us understand the relation of the physical sciences to each other. By helping clarify what the specialized sciences are studying, and how their subject matters relate to each other, we can better see the specialized sciences not as fragmentary and unrelated inquiries, but as parts of a larger coherent inquiry into the physical world. Third, attention to the four modes of causality could help us understand the relation of the physical sciences to other types of inquiry. How might biology, chemistry, and physics relate to sociology or political science or ethics? Positivism aimed to unite the sciences in a reductionist way, as if everything, including human sciences, could be eventually translated into physics. Aristotelian causality helps us understand that the higher can't be reduced to the lower, that every order might have its own proper actualities and ends worthy of study. Indeed, in Aristotle, we can understand ethics as a particular part of the study of human nature, namely the human telos, or purpose, and which accidental forms or habits will help us achieve our end. And Aquinas's Summa Theologia can be understood as placing this kind of inquiry into the context of a whole cosmology so that human beings ordered toward their end are but a microcosm of the whole universe achieving its end. This suggests my fourth and final reason why attention to the four modes of causality in nature could be helpful today. It can point toward the necessity of other inquiry beyond the science of nature. I mentioned earlier that characterizing natural things which act for ends as composites of matter and form raises questions which natural philosophy itself cannot answer. If in nature form always and only exists in matter, can there be such a thing as a form existing without matter? Is there any reality which is not physical reality? If a form is the principle of intelligibility, but forms must inhere in matter, is there, in reality, always some degree of unintelligibility? If things come to be thanks to an agent, must there be a first agent that started at all? Aristotle actually gives an argument for the unmoved mover, a primal agent, in the physics. He doesn't wait for the metaphysics for that. That's an argument in the physics first. But what we learn about this unmoved mover there is necessarily limited. What is it like? The only answer is that beyond the description of it as an unmoved mover, it isn't really the business of physics to say what it's like. Physics has proven the existence of something that is presupposed by natural phenomena. But since this thing whose existence is proven is not itself a natural phenomenon, it is not subject to change. It cannot be investigated by physics. It is not so strange for a science to uncover something that is beyond its scope to inquire into. Someone studying the refraction of light may come to realize that light obeys certain geometric laws, but then if he investigates those laws, he's not engaging in a study of light anymore. He's engaging in geometry. So too, physics for Aristotle leads to a place where it must acknowledge its own limits. 
the need for a science in some sense prior to the science of the natural world that can investigate something that is beyond the capacity of physics to investigate. Note that even if one were inclined to criticize Aristotle's proof for the existence of a prime mover, for instance, even if one wanted to insist that everything that is real is material, one would have to go beyond the limits of physics as a science. For the materialist claim that there is nothing beyond the physical world is not a claim that physics itself can make. Thus, even before we see how these further questions can be answered, Aristotle's science of physical causes raises further questions about the nature of reality and calls forth another fundamental or higher science. The four causes discovered in physics thus put the science of nature in the context of an even more general and universal human wonder about the ultimate causes of the physical world itself.